It's Mrs. Ferris from Wood Library. Are you ready for some bedtime stories? I know I am. I know Bernard is. So let's get started. Our first story tonight is called Grumpy Monkey All Night Long. Look at those eyes. This is a brand new book at the library. It's written by Susan Lang and illustrated by Max Lang. I bet they're husband and wife. And it's published by Random House. And I hope you're not grumpy tonight. I should probably mention before we get started, I'd love to see who is watching. So say hi in the comments. Early in the evening, just about supper time, Norman heard a whole lot of hooping and hollering next door. See what Norman is? Yeah, he's a gorilla. What's the ruckus? Norman asked his neighbor, Jim Pansy. I'm so excited, Jim exclaimed. I'm going to have a sleepover at my parents' house. My whole family will be there. Mom, Dad, my big sisters, Anne and Nan. Who's that? asked Norman. Oh, yeah, my, my little brother, Tim. But never mind. It'll still be fun. Sleepovers are a good time, Norman agreed. Jim talked about all the great things he would do. First, we'll go termite fishing. And next, we'll tell scary stories. And then we'll have a midnight feast and wash it down with some jungle punch. Oh, I wouldn't drink punch too close to bedtime, Norman advised. Bedtime, exclaimed Jim. Nobody sleeps at a sleepover. We're going to stay up all night. Sounds fun, said Norman. Mind if I tag along? Now, a little later, they arrived at the tree where Jim's parents lived. Oh, it's my grumpy little monkey, Jim's mom cried as she gave him a hug. I'm so happy to see you. Mom, moaned Jim, I'm not little, and I'm not a monkey. I'm an ape. Jim smiled. Mom smiled and ruffled his fur. But you sure are grumpy, she said. No, I'm not, Jim scowled. I like your mom, said Norman. No fair! You didn't say we could bring a friend, said a voice coming down the path. Who's that? asked Norman. Tim! exclaimed Jim's family. I thought you said he was your little brother, said Norman. I had a growth spurt, said Tim. What should we do first? asked Jim's mom. Well, everybody answered at once. Termite fishing! Pick fleas off each other! Bob for mangoes! I know, said Tim. Measure each other to see who's tallest. Maybe our guests should choose, suggested Jim's dad, turning to Norman. Mm. It's a tough decision, said Norman. It all sounds fun. Don't worry, said Anne. There'll be plenty of time to do everything because we're going to stay up all night, cheered Jim and his siblings. I don't know, said Jim's mom. Staying up all night could make for some grumpy monkeys. Well, then the games began. They did termite fishing and flea picking, bobbing for mangoes, scary stories. It was a dark and stormy night, said Jim. Tim trembled. Your brother's scared, said Jim's mom. Why not tell a happy story instead? Then they had a midnight feast. Hey, you have to share the jungle punch. But you didn't share the bananas. I don't think Jim and Tim get along very well, do you? And then what did they do? Well, they stayed up all night. It's really dark, said Tim, looking around. Because it's night, snapped Jim. Are you grumpy? asked Tim. No said Jim, and just then they heard a noise. Rawr! Thunder! shouted
shouted Tim, and his eyes went wide. And no, no, oh no, now it is dark and stormy. Don't worry, said Jim. It's just Norman snoring. He does a lot of funny noises. Sometimes it sounds like rah, 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 rah. And sometimes it sounds like <laughs> Tim laughed. And other times it sounds like <laughs> Jim and Tim laughed and laughed all night long. And as the sun came up, Tim fell asleep. Good idea, little brother, said Jim as he tucked Tim in and lay down. But just as he was about to close his eyes, Good morning, my monkeys, sang Jim's mom. Mom, shouted Jim, we're not monkeys, we're apes. I prefer gorilla, but yeah, ape works, said Norman. Oh, Jim, I told you staying up all night would make you grumpy, said Jim's mom, ruffling his fur. I'm not. You'll always be my grumpy monkey, whispered Jim's mom, because as you might notice, whoops, let's get it in frame here. Jim. Jim Pansy, he's sound asleep. But sometimes that happens if you stay up too late, you'll become a grumpy monkey. Well, can we get our monkeys to ready? Let's see, should we have them up in the tree tonight or jumping on the bed? Hmm. Anybody want to tell me? Well, I think we'll have them up in the tree because those monkeys were all up in the tree. So, can you put your five monkeys up in the tree? This is your tree. Get And over at the other side, get ready with Mr. Crocodile. Five little monkeys were sitting in the tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. But along came Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap. So hide one of those monkeys. Four little monkeys are sitting in the tree, Teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So hide another one. We have one, two, three. Three little monkeys are sitting in the tree. Teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So two little monkeys are sitting in the tree. Teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So now there's one little monkey sitting in the tree. Teasing Mr. Crocodile, you can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile, as hungry as can be, and he goes, snap! So how many are left? Can you show me nine? No little monkeys are sitting in the tree. I'd better watch out so he won't catch me. Did he catch you? I hope not. Well, this is a story called Wolf, Wolf. Looks like it takes place in Japan. I've seen cherry blossoms and some very beautiful umbrellas. This is a story that's written and illustrated by John Rocco. And it's published by Hyperion Books for Children. And there you can see the wolf. What does it look like he's doing? Guess we'll have to read and find out. Well, the hungry old wolf was too slow to snatch birds and too stiff to chase rabbits. So he tried growing food in a small garden. The sign says wolf's carrots. This one says wolf's peas. Bah! Weeds everywhere. He sounds grumpy, doesn't he? I wonder if he stayed up all night. There are so many weeds, I can't even find the gar vegetables, the old wolf growled, rubbing his empty stomach. And as he yanked dandelions from where the carrots should have been, why, his ears began to twitch. Old Wolf fumbled with his hearing aid. Who's calling me? 
I don't remember having any friends on this mountain. In fact, oh, the old wolf didn't have any friends on any mountain. Maybe they have some food to share. A mere morsel would do, he said. Well, his bones creaked and his joints cracked as he slowly made his way toward the voice. After a tiring climb and two stubbed toes, the old wolf came to a clearing. What's this? A boy? With goats? The old wolf drooled with excitement. Oh, surely he can spare one for a hungry wolf. But before he could step into the meadow, a group of villagers came clamoring up the hillside. The old wolf stayed hidden behind the bamboo as the villagers surrounded the boy. Where's the wolf? A villager cried out, waving a stick. Did he take any goats? Another gasped. What wolf? The little boy giggled. There's no wolf. We ran up this hill for nothing? The eldest wheezed. Call us only if you see a wolf, scolded another. Well, the old wolf wasn't fond of angry villagers, especially ones with sticks, so he limped down to a nearby stream. Kids, he said, mm, always playing tricks on old folks and old wolves. He groaned as he soaked his tired feet. Now before long, the boy's cry came again. Wolf! Wolf! The wolf is taking the goats! Another wolf is taking those tasty goats, the old wolf thought. Oh, he couldn't stand the thought and quickly hobbled back to the meadow. Well, the villagers were already there, huffing and puffing from running up the hill. Where's the wolf? Are the goats okay? The villagers gasped. What wolf? The boy laughed. And from behind the tree, the old wolf watched the villagers stagger back down the hill. Oh, he thought, there's got to be a way to get one of those scrumptious goats from that trickster, he thought. Perhaps a trick of my own. Well, the old wolf sat down to work out a plan and soon was snoring away dreaming of moo shoe goat and double goat dumplings. Wolf! Wolf! The boy yelled out again. Ah, I can't even enjoy the goats in my dreams, the old wolf growled. That boy is worse than weeds. He stretched his aching legs and he went to the meadow once more. Perfect. Not a villager in sight. The old wolf slowly crept toward the boy. The goats swiftly scattered to the far edge of the meadow. <laughs> Were you calling me for lunch? The old wolf grinned. Wolf! Wolf! There is a wolf! The boy cried as he scrambled up at the tree. Quit your yelling, said the wolf. Those villagers won't believe you anyway. But, but this time it's true. They have to believe me. You're, you're a real wolf, and you're going to take the goats. The old wolf knew his legs were too tired to chase down those goats. So he carefully lowered himself onto a nearby rock and gazed up at the boy. His lips curled in a smile. The villagers are only going to believe you if you really are missing a goat he said. I can help you with that. Just one goat? The boy leaned forward on the branch. I'm a picky eater. That plump one looks, hmm, about right. But you have to bring it to me because if I go over there, I might change my mind and grab them all. Bring it to you? The boy asked. On the other side of the mountain, the old wolf said. You'll find a small garden. Just tie it to the fence post there. And he started home. 
Well, the next morning, the old wolf was overjoyed to see a plump goat nibbling away in his garden. Good fortune at last, he said. Oh, today I'll feast like an old wolf should. And he rubbed his paws together. The wolf's mouth watered and his stomach grumbled as he crept behind the goat. And suddenly, he noticed something quite remarkable. Everywhere he looked, there were ripe and juicy vegetables. Oh, there was baby bok choy and beautiful eggplant, ready to pick carrots, and even his favorite, onions. The old wolf couldn't believe his eyes. And then he saw the goat happily eating the last few weeds. She saw him too, and she froze in fear. You ate my weeds the old goat said. But why didn't you eat the vegetables? Sorry, I'm a picky eater, said the goat. Please don't eat me. The wolf looked at the plump goat and then at all the juicy vegetables and then back at the goat again and he sighed. <sighs> don't be sorry. You did my work for me. What's one breakfast compared to a delicious, oh, delicious vegetables for the rest of my days? The wolf smiled as he untied the goat. I could use a friend like you. Plus, double goat dumplings are overrated anyway. So that's how Wolf got someone to clear out his garden of all the weeds so he could get the vegetables and he made a new friend. I like that. Well, I think it's probably time to reach in your pocket. And if you don't have a real pocket, pretend one works fine, but reach down and pull out your pretend bubble gum, unwrap it, throw the wrapper in the trash, and then we're gonna put the gum in our mouth, chew it up until it's all soft and squishy, and then we'll do the disgusting thing that we like to do with it. So. Get ready to chew. One, two, three. Is yours ready? I think mine is. One, put your hand out. Two, three, spit your gum in your hand. And clap your other hand on top. And we've got sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your nose. How do we get it off? We have to say unstick, don't we? Unstick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your back. On stick, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your chin. On stick, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your arm. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your cheek. On stick, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your knee. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum. You know what comes next, don't you? Stick it on mom or dad. Go ahead. I'll wait. On stick. Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, stick it on your toe. On stick, 
Sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum, sticky, sticky bubble gum. It's time to throw it in the trash. Now we're getting to a time when, let me think, I think I may save that one for next week. So we had a story about vegetables, didn't we? Mm hmm And I was surprised that that was what Wolf really wanted to eat was vegetables instead of a sheep. But you know who don't usually eat vegetables? Zombies. This is called Zombies Don't Eat Veggies. It's created by Megan Lacerra and Jorge Lacerra. And it is published by Children's Book Press. And I see some vegetables there. I see tomatoes and artichokes, celery, peppers, radish, and carrots. They all look pretty good to me, but I'm not a zombie. Are you? Mo was a zombie. That's Mo right there. With a deep, dark craving. Oh, it was dreadful, devious, absolutely despicable. Mo loved to eat vegetables. He grew all kinds of veggies in his hidden garden and then in his hidden secret kitchen, he crafted celery, tomatoes, and carrots into oh, delicioso meals that he devoured with delight. Now, Mo's mom and dad did not love vegetables. Not one bit. Veggies were yucky, disgusting. They were not allowed at the Romero's dinner table. Dad said, are you ready to chase some humans in the marathon next week, Mojo? Oh, zombies were supposed to eat zombie cuisine like brain cakes, brain stew, and brain and beetle tortillas. Brain and bean, I think that is. Most parents insisted that their niño, their little boy, eat only zombie food. Finger foods, my dear? Oh, look at those. Oh. I'm not hungry, said Mo. Well, Mo tried to convince his mom and dad to give peas a chance. He sneaked vegetables in wherever he could. What? He used a head of lettuce? Or, hmm, some grains in the bread instead of brains? Mo's attempts were fruitless. His parents wanted him to accept that he was a zombie, and zombies don't eat vegetables. Well, Mo knew he did not like zombie cuisine, and he couldn't imagine letting go of spinach or cucumbers or kale forever. If zombies are only supposed to eat zombie cuisine, Mo started to wonder if maybe, maybe, he wasn't a zombie at all. Day after day, Mo wondered how he could make his parents understand his love of vegetables. His tomatoes oh, were tantalizing. His cucumbers, crispy. The peppers, oh, perfection. Add onions and some garlic and a touch of cilantro and gazpacho! It's a vegetable soup. Holy aioli, Mo had an idea, and it was his best one yet. Mo grabbed his book of recipes, and his fingers flew across the pages until he found the recipe for tomato and veggie-filled soup. Oh, he was sure the tomatoes would make it look bloody and gloopy, just like a zombie dish. His parents were going to devour it. So Mo chopped and diced and pureed and blended and perfected and poured. And finally, the soup was finished. Mo carefully shuffled it over to the house for dinner. Where he found a feast fit 
for a zombie. Mo, you're just in time, said Dad. Try some arpanadas. I made spicy mayonnaise. Oh, do you want to see what they had there? They had pickled tongue. Oh dear, I don't even know how to pronounce that because my Spanish is terrible. Arroz con spleens. Famoso chili con ayo or oil. It's made of eyeballs. Doritos for dipping. And those are the empanadas made out of real arms. I, I made something for you to try too. It's called blood bile bisque. Bon Appetit gave it five brains. <laughs> Smells strange, but looks delightful, said Dad. Mmm, five brains. Oh, it must be delicious, said his mother. So they dug in. <laughs> Mo closed his eyes and sucked in his breath. <sighs> this was it. They'd savor the soup. They'd ask for more. Mo imagined breakfast, lunches, and dinners, and snacks, all vegetables, raw, cooked, steamed, and fried forever and ever. He saw all his dreams coming true until Mo's parents did not like the soup. Not one bit. <laughs> This, this soup tastes like, like vegetables. Yuck. Oh dear, look at his mom. She lost her head over it. Mo's heart sank to his toes. His plan was a bust. How many times do we have to tell you that zombies don't eat veggies, said Dad. Maybe other zombies don't eat vegetables, but I do, Mom and Dad. I'm different. But I'm still me, Mauricio Romero, your niño, your Mo. Mo reminded his parents that he liked chasing humans as they ran in marathons. And he promised that he'd always cheer for dad during championship brain eating competitions. And he loved doing the zombie shuffle under the moonlight with mom. He was a zombie, a Romero. He just liked to eat vegetables. Well, Mo's parents loved their son and they finally accepted that it was okay to be different. They even promised Mo that they would eat more veggies for him. But only a teeny little bit. What did he make? Fried fiddled head ferns, artichoke hearts and elbow macaroni, patacones, ears of corn with dead sea salt and butter, be still my hearts of palm chop salad, the Romeros knew that most zombies don't eat veggies, but they were more than zombies. They were family. And if you ever borrow this book from the library and you like veggies, you can make Moe's Garden Gazpacho, also known as Blood Bile Bisque. The recipe's right in the back of the book. Yum. Well, shall we have our flannel board story? I think we should. It's also about something edible. Not mm, gazpacho, but stew. Well, there was once a wolf who loved to eat more than anything else in the whole world. And as soon as he finished one meal, he was ready for the next one. Now, one day, Wolf had a terrible craving for chicken stew. All day long, he walked around the forest in search of a delicious chicken. And finally, finally, he spotted one. Ah, 
he said, she would be just perfect for my stew. So the wolf crept a little closer. But just as he was about to grab his prey, he had another idea. If there was some way, some way to fatten this bird a little more, hmm, then there would be all the more stew for me. So the wolf ran home to his kitchen and he began to cook. I'm going to put up the chicken's door. First, he made about a hundred scrumptious pancakes. Let's get it back a little so it's not blurry for you. And then late at night, he left them on the chicken's front porch. Eat well, my pretty chickens, he called. Get nice and fat for my stew. And he went back on home. Well, the next night, he brought a hundred scrumptious donuts, and he left them on Chicken's porch. Eat well, my pretty chicken. Get nice and fat for my stew. Well, every night he tried something. He made a scrumptious cake, weighing about a hundred pounds, and left that on the Chicken's porch. Eat well, my pretty chicken. Get nice and fat for my stew. Well, he made all those things, and he thought, Mmm, that chicken must be as fat as a balloon by now. Let's see. So he peeked at the chicken's house, but all of a sudden the door opened, and the chicken screeched, Oh! So it was you, Mr. Wolf. Oh, children, children, look at what Mr. Wolf has brought for us. Oh, my goodness, they, all of those presents were from you. You brought the scrumptious pancakes and the delicious donuts and that huge, heavy cake, all for us. Oh, they weren't from Santa Claus after all, she said. Well, the baby chicks jumped all over Mr. Wolf. And they gave him about a hundred kisses. <coughs> oh, thanks, Uncle Wolf. You're the best cook in the whole world. Well, Uncle Wolf didn't have any chicken stew that night. But Mrs. Chicken, well, she fixed him. A nice dinner anyway. Oh, shucks, he said as he left them. And he went back home. Maybe tomorrow I'll make the little critters, hmm, a hundred scrumptious cookies. <laughs> so I'm glad that this wolf turned out to be as nice as the one in the other story we had. Well, let's have our last book, the one we always finish up with. The Going to Bed book by Sandra Boynton. The sun is set not long ago. Now everybody goes below to take a bath in one big tub with soap all over. Scrub, scrub, scrub. They hang their towels on the wall and find pajamas big and small. And with some on top and some beneath, they brush and brush and brush their teeth. And when the moon is on the rise, they all go up to exercise. And down once more, but not so fast. They're on their way to bed at last. The day is done. They say good night. And somebody turns off the light. The moon is high, the sea is deep, and they rock and rock and rock to sleep. So I hope you have some good dreams when you go to sleep tonight. Bernard and I will see you again next week. Thanks for joining us for Bedtime Stories with Mrs. Ferris. Bye-bye. <laughs>